Thank you, Duarte, for that introduction. That was very nice. I'm worried that you're going to say something bad. Anyways, um, I hope everyone's doing okay. Um, I can't see the chat. Just a second. I'm going to see if I can find it over here. Yeah, there you go. I'm going to put this over here just in case there's any questions. Um, so today we're going to talk about, um, you know, what I have seen here at the University of Arizona in terms of small animal processing. And um, I hope I don't keep you from dinner if you haven't had any dinner yet. So here in this facility, um, these are kind of our numbers from the last few years that I have been running the facility. And I have noticed that we have increased a lot of what we do in terms of beef animal production. Um, we have uh, pork that has decreased, lamb has decreased, but mostly beef has increased in the past few years. Um, the University of Arizona Food Products and Safety Lab is a USDA inspected facility that harvests mostly meat animals. We also will every now and then harvest turkeys, chickens, emus, rheas, other, other exotics, uh, yaks, bison. We have not done bison in a couple of years. Um, they're just a little too aggressive, et cetera. But um, over the last year, we have increased a lot of what we do in terms of beef. Um, at one point, we we're doing a lot of pork products, um, but the, the customer that we, we were doing then uh, is no longer with us. So um, we dropped in, in that increased beef. Lamb has remained fairly stable and goat numbers have actually dropped quite a bit. So I have some theories of why that is happening. But um, overall, uh, it just has to do where, where these products are going, right? So in the state of Arizona, these are, these are uh, uh, rough numbers of how many animals are killed under state inspection. And there's a lot more state inspected lamb, sheep, and goat harvested in the state than there is federal. Um, most of these animals here end up in the area of Phoenix, um, metropolitan area. There's certain populations that will eat a lot of lamb, uh, sheep, goat, um, meat. Um, quite a few of them are not even inspected. They're actually just harvested. A lot of them are just harvested in backyards, etc. But if you're looking at just inspected meat that is harvested for resale, these are the numbers for the state facilities. So just so you get an idea, um, you can be USDA inspected or ADA inspected. If you are a USDA inspected plant, like we are here in the University of Arizona, your products that are produced can be sold anywhere in the United States. They are federally inspected, so they can go to any state of the union and um, uh, be sold then. If you're ADA inspected or Arizona Department of Agriculture inspected, you can only sell that product in Arizona. So, if you are um, planning on growing a business and having animals harvested, uh, if you're just covering the state of Arizona, great. It is okay, I would say, to, to use a, you, a Arizona Department of Ag uh, plant. <clears throat> but as soon as you wanna move toward a online sales where someone can order from <clears throat> California, New Mexico, New York, uh, you know, anywhere in the United States, your product has to be inspected by USDA. Otherwise, you are not gonna be able to sell it um, across those state lines. And if you do, you're actually breaking the rules. So that would, uh, that would not be good. <coughs> so USDA inspected, this is what the, what the, what we call in the industry, the bug or the uh, the inspection uh, legend here, it says USDA or US Inspected and Passed Department of Agriculture. Our number here at the University of Arizona, it's 966. I'm not sure whose number uh, this one is here for ADA, but uh, for University of Arizona, it is 966. So if you buy product that has uh, uh, a label like this, that means it was produced in a USDA inspected plant. Now here in Arizona, we don't have a lot of lamb or sheep production. Um, so there's very minimal amounts that we do in terms of lamb 
and goat. There was a USDA plant down in Cochise County that was doing more lamb and goat, but I think they have reduced their numbers this year. So fortunately, they're not doing as much as they were. So you can see here goat going down. At one point, a few years back, when we were looking at these numbers, goat numbers were really increasing because of youth projects for 4-H for um, kids. I think that 4-H, at least for us here, 4-H um, projects such as goats and lamb were able to keep those numbers up for us, but they, they have reduced inter in interest in the last few years. Um, goat meat is one of those meats that it is a really good pr product, but it has to be sold, right? Similar to lamb, we as uh, consumers will buy meat thinking that we're gonna take, it's gonna taste like beef. At least a lot of people are. Um, so when we're trying to sell a product, if you like goat and if you like lamb, remember you're not selling to yourself, you're selling to someone else. So we gotta figure out what it is that people do not like about certain meats. And goat tends to have a uh, gamier taste to a lot of people, okay? So there's a lot of different products that can be sold out of a goat. Um, most of the products that you're going to get are going to be bone-in. Goat and lamb, most of the products should be bone-in. If you bone out a, a, a goat or a lamb, you end up with very little product. It is really hard to actually bone out these products because of such small, brittle bones. When you take a knife, you might end up with a lot of bone in the meat. So most packers do not like to grind these because it takes forever to bone them out. And then you could end up with, with product, with bone in the product. When you're looking at a beef animal compared to a goat, um, a beef animal has a lot bigger muscles. So you can actually separate muscles where if you look at this animal here, let's say the, the, the shoulder, for example, you know, one shoulder of a goat might feed four or five people, depending on how you cook it. One shoulder, if we compare a shoulder to a chuck of a beef, you're talking about 40, 50 people can eat from one. So <clears throat> these animals tend to be cooked um, bone in. And you, know, you end up with about 50% from live to carcass and about 70% to 80% of, of, of that carcass is actually edible product. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people don't like, um, tend, tend, they don't like a lot of that waste, we can say. Um, it seems to them like it's waste, but the on the good part, goats will survive on pretty much nothing. So there are a good option for ranches that are kind of, rocky, steep, that have a lot of browsing. Okay. And, you know, there's different ways you can actually cook it to actually get your customers, if you are going to be selling the meat, to, um, to, to actually eat this product. Cabrito here, for example, in the northern part of Mexico, Texas or so, they're marinated and then grilled. And that is a younger goat. Duarte Diaz and myself, Dr. Diaz and myself, have been trying to go to different places to eat. So we found this place that has an interesting product. It's called, it's birria. Typically, it's just a meat, but in this case, they decided to put ramen. So, you know, that's a different way of, of selling a product and getting customers to like it. So if you are, if you are trying to sell your product, you know, you actually have to do a harder, it's a harder job to sell goat and lamb than it is to sell beef because most Americans are used to beef products. And when you present lamb or goat, they say, oh, you know, the goat's too gamey. I don't like it too much. On the other hand, lamb might be too, um, it kind of tastes like tallow. The fat is too strong for them. And that has to do with fat, not necessarily with the taste of the meat, but the fat tastes a little different to them. Now, like I was saying earlier, lamb, um, for us here at the University of Arizona, we have seen a decrease from last year to this year, but still fairly average, I would say. Um, 
we have pretty good customers that bring us lamb on a regular basis and we try to take care of those customers first and um i think i saw one of their names uh, today in the participants here but um they're not um when we talk about lamb <clears throat> you know we can't we can't mix lamb and mutton and expect customers to always like that product we don't want to make sure that if we have customers that like lamb we sell them lamb and mutton we sell mutton we don't mix the two because if you end up with a really uh, strong flavor on one you might not um, keep that customer for very long okay so similar to to uh, a goat there's a lot of uh, different cuts that are mostly bone in you won't really have a lot of boneless cuts for example tenderloin or backstrap you end up with very little of it so most people will actually sell this product as a bone-in product and you know you can find again different ways you have lamb chops you have gyro meat um, and i'm sure there's a lot there's some more people here that can tell me that lamb is the best meat in the world and um can give me a whole bunch of different recipes and I agree with you there's a lot of different products different recipes you can do with lamb I enjoy all meats and I think that um, you just have to train your palate to like different products just do it over and over again until you find that one specific taste that you prefer after a while so this is my recommendations for goats don't think I am not an expert in small ruminants I can just tell you from my experience of what I've seen here, but we want to make sure that we're looking at genetics. We want to look at that body composition of that animal. And if we're trying to sell meat, we want to focus on meat genetics, a goat that looks like this, for example. We do not want a goat that looks like this for meat purposes. We do not, there's not a lot of dual purpose goats out there. So if you're raising animals for meat, focus on the meat. If you're just raising for, for, for milk, then don't expect that meat to be worth a lot after those animals are cold from your herd. It's not, fat is not a big issue on goats. They don't get too fat. Um, I would say um, you don't want to focus on just fat on these animals. Most customers that eat goat, they tend to eat goat because it's a leaner, pro leaner product and they like that leanness of it. Castrate these animals. If you don't, you end up with off taste in the meat. Um, a lot of people do not castrate because they don't know how. Goat, lamb, pretty easy with a bander, right? And like I put here, do not use old animals for prime meat. If you have a customer that is used to this kind of younger goat product and you sell them something from an old animal, you're going to lose that customer. So don't mix one or the two. If you are going to if you are going to bone out a, uh, an older you uh, an older um, doe or um, a buck if you really want to try to make some products that are spiced up maybe like chorizo or sausages or different things that kind of take that flavor away okay now lamb again depending on genetics you know you have lambs that are early maturing a white faced lamb like we have here at the u of a that we use for research they tend to get fattier and they are early maturing so by the time we get them on uh, our kill floor they might have a whole bunch of fat on them. So that's one of the things that customers reject from lamb is that having too much fat, actually, um, they don't really like that. So you wanna make sure that that you, depending on the breed that you're raising, you, you are harvest them on, you know, at the right time. So do castrate. <clears throat> Make sure that you are again taking care of those problems you know too much too much uh testosterone sometimes is not good for the meat uh, of, of these animals castrate the the, the young <clears throat> lambs and that's going to be your better tasting meat at least for the american customers All right now here at the university of arizona we're not really set up to do a lot of lamb and goat we have had a lot of challenges over the last few years. Um, this facility was built in 1988. Uh, we have a lot of older equipment that we're working on replacing. Um, university kind of increases our, our cost of operation every so often. A lot of you might know how that works, where they can't figure out how to manage something. They just tax 
the people working. Um, you know, increasing minimum wage, that kind of makes it a little bit harder. We as a, as a university cannot be competing with local businesses, so we cannot take away business from any other place. Um, I'm not sure if you know, but we are feedlot here nearby is closing, so we don't have a lot of uh, uh, animals available for a short period of time. But skilled labor, you do not have a lot of people that know how to harvest these animals and cut these animals. Lamb and goat, because they are bone in, it's a lot easier to do than other products if, if you are actually just cutting them. But, you know, we have outdated equipment here at this facility that, that we have been replacing over the past five years. And I think that's part, that's partially what we can grow and, and, and provide more services. We recently hired a new meat science person and he does uh, research in uh, specifically meat and value added products. So he's, he's on board, his name's Dr. Dwayne Wolf, and he's gonna be with us here for the next, um, well, I hope for a while, but uh, he just started a year ago. And um, <clears throat> uh, in the near future, we hope to do a lot more research in, in small ruminants as well as beef, beef animals. So what can we do for you? I mean, I'm open to questions after this um, short little talk that I gave you. But we do a lot of outreach for, for kids. We show them how to, and I know these are small, not small ruminants, but this is a FFA uh, field day where we kind of help students how to, how to grade animals and what to look at them and what to see, what, 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 what to look for for quality and quantity and all different things like that. I think I need to open the chat so I can see questions. All right. Well, we haven't had any questions yet. Sometimes people are a little bit shy, but hopefully we can get some in there. But can you talk to me? I know that you have created a whole bunch of products for at what I know as the meat lab, because I was <laughs> here in school 30 years ago. So FL, MNO, QP, whatever. Can you talk about some of those products that you've created and that you're marketing? What's in well, them? Here at the, uh, we create products depending on what customer wants um, because we haven't had a research person on board for a long time. I've been focusing on teaching and management of the facility, but we have worked on sausages. A lot of the sausages that we make, we try to um, make them kind of regional. So we, we make one with green chili, for example, and cheese from the region. So that works pretty good for us. Uh, we make our jerky similar to the Sonoran style a little drier jerky rather than uh you know that thick sweet one um we also <clears throat> we also um just a second i'm trying to move my bar here um we also make uh snack sticks of four or five different flavors but anytime you want to create a product we are open to suggestions as long as we have the time to do it because there are times where we want to we want to do more. It's just right now the push is we need to harvest and uh, um, harvest more more animals for the for these consumers. Um, Wildcat burger, man, don't forget. <laughs> yeah, so the Wildcat burger it's, it's very similar to the other one. It has green chili, bacon, other different things uh, attached to it. Um, but again, we can do whatever you can imagine with what we have here. Um, a couple years back, I helped a customer create um, a bar that has uh, berries and nuts and other things like that. You might find it on Amazon now. It's called DNX bars. So they have, like they have yeah. all kinds of different things in that bar, but it's more like a full meal. So it's a ah. meat bar with other products in it. So stuff like that. Okay, we do have a question that came in. Do you have customers for hair slash meat sheep and are they preferred or not? So I would say I personally do not have a, a lot of uh, customers that have hair sheep, but I prefer them any day, especially in, the, in, the, in Arizona. Um, they produce good, very good meat. I actually raised some when I was younger um, down at my parents' ranch. And when we're actually harvesting these animals, so slaughtering these animals, we don't get spines in our hands because when we get those wool sheep, we're, we're, we're skinning them. And when we grab onto that wool, there's so much thorns and everything else that by the time you're done killing these, these, uh, 
sheep that are out in native Arizona range, your hands are just destroyed <laughs> from, from so many thorns that they have. The meat from them, I think hair sheep produce really good meat. And I, I would prefer them in a desert over wool type animals. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have some fans of green chili cheese brats and jerky with only salt and black pepper. Yep. <laughs> You know, Duarte is wild about the wildcat burger every time <laughs> I've heard about it. I've had, I have some in my freezer, I think, actually. <laughs> um, yeah. I have a question, Sam. Um, you know, historically, at least for, for sheep meat, has been there's, there's a lot of seasonality uh, with it, especially with the uh, different ethnic groups and, and, you know, time of the years where they're, they're more consumption. Is, is that good for the market or, or, you know, does that create problems too? Because then you have to, you know, the, the, the production system has to be working around the year just to meet the demands of a couple months of, of production. Well, you know, if, if the product is going to be sold only in a few times of the year, um, we need to make sure that when we're breeding, and I know this is hard with sheep and lamb, we try to target those, those times. Um, especially, you know, you have Easter, around Easter, lamb, and then you have um, Ramadan around that time when, when, when a lot of the Arab population will, will tend to eat um, small, you know, lamb or sheep. But a lot of them, they actually want to do it themselves. So if you're grazing sheep and, and lamb, you know, you might want to think about kosher, halal, that type of um, ritual slaughter too. So we can actually sell sheep and lamb year round but we are not selling large quantities. Um, I think there are other, so a lot of our customers, they actually do sell a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, product. Uh, for example, Skyland Ranch uh, South in, in Cochise County, they, they will sell product year round, I think if we can slaughter them year round. Mm -hmm. um, we have other customers in Sonoida and again in Cochise County that, that, that as, as many spots that we can have for them in terms of sheep, uh, lambs, they will, they will take and harvest them. So they can sell the product. Uh, it's just, can, can you scale it up, right? Yep. When you get to a large um, number, I'm not sure we can sustain that. Um, so that's one of those tough things, you know, but if you are selling like we do here, you know, we freeze all our meat as soon as it's uh, cut up. So our customers know that, that uh, the meat that they're buying, it's frozen, but it's flash frozen for freshness. So it's still pretty fresh when they thought because we, we flash froze it. So it's just a lot of training your customers to understand that if you produce a large number at once, you're going to be selling them throughout the year. But you know, we're doing everything in our, in our power to make sure that they're still getting a very fresh product, even though it's frozen. You understand? So we got, uh, Jim says, no uh, ground lamb meatloaf because too much fat and not edible. <laughs> <laughs> well, meatloaf is tricky, man. <laughs> well, that's one of those things that the fat tends to, to, to discourage people from eating lamb. But um, I've, I've known actually some people that actually prefer lamb fat and they prefer them as fatty as we can get them to them. So there's a... Uh, there's definitely different people out there. Okay, so we'll give a last call for questions. You've seen a couple of times in the chat, I put the link to the survey for all three nights. If you attended one or two, just fill out information on those, but that feedback really helps us. Um, if we don't see any more questions in the next minute or so, then we certainly thank you, Dr. Garcia, for your um great presentation along with everybody else that presented tonight. And I think for, you know, obviously we'd love to be in person doing our dog and pony show as we call it going across the state, but I think we've done some really, um, had some really great presentations all three nights. So Duarte, you have any words or Ashley, any other words to share? Um, yeah, like uh, as a closing statement for me, uh, we, we tried to do this small room minute uh, specific session this year uh, because we, we've heard in the past that there was some some genuine interest. Uh, so I, I, I would be um, 
I, I would encourage you guys to to make comments on the on the evaluation to let us know uh, if this is a direction or something that you guys think we should do more consistently. Um, we obviously want to cover stakeholders around the state, so if this is something that that we can do as part of this meeting, or maybe even have a small ruminant workshop that's independent in the future, we'd like to know what your feedback is. Uh, again, we we hope that um, next year we'll we'll be back on onto normal for us. This this conference actually marks the year from COVID because we actually got shut down the day after the conference. So. Um, it's a little bit of a deja vu, deja vu, but we would love to to get some feedback and, and let us know um, if this is something that you guys found useful. And and if you do, also some recommendations of uh, future uh, topics and, and information that you would like to. Uh, hey, Sam, we got another. Is sheep lanolin the gamey taste? Yeah, well, it's it's yes. And and also it comes with age too so you can smaller younger lambs will have it but not as not as much as the other ones so that is part of the taste that people reject taste profile okay and ashley right get your get your face out here because you've been helping <laughs> hold hold court with Duarte and i and debbie reed <laughs> and come share some last thoughts since you've been involved in this uh range livestock workshop planning as well. She come in there she is. <laughs> I was, I was going to take her time slot, you know. I know, that's why I called on her. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't get my button to work. It wouldn't click on it. I'm not sure. I think I clicked it twice and turned it on and off and it took it a second to catch up to me. Um, yeah, uh, I think Duarte pretty well summed it up. It has been a year. In fact, the Facebook memory from Prescott popped up on Facebook for me, I think yesterday. Um, of all of us gathered and uh, gosh, what a year it's been. Um, I saw a lot of names that I really recognize in, uh, um, on tonight and on the last couple nights and uh, kind of miss getting to sit and visit with everybody. Um, that's, the, that's the one thing about virtual is you don't get to do that. But um, thanks for being here with us. And hopefully uh, next year we will be back on the road for the, the three day tour of the state. Okay, and certainly we want to thank Jim and BI for uh, providing some sponsorship as well. And our speakers tonight, Andrea, Chad, Sam, Duarte sneaking in there, moderating and speaking, and then also Jocelyn, Dr. Beard from Nebraska. And we certainly look forward to seeing some more for, from all of you down the road. So. Thank you very much. We got you off early today, but we had some great information. So at this point, we will, if you attended any of these, you will get a, a survey email reminder for the survey as well. Jim, did you have some last goodbyes that you wanted to share? Probably nothing nobody want, anybody wants to hear. So. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. And, and I'll echo, I look forward to the roadshow next year. Yes. Okay. And we have some, oh, you're muted Duarte. And I didn't do it to you. <laughs> I was just telling Jim, thanks for his support. Like always. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much. And of course we also have Nate on here, who is also one of our extension colleagues and George rule was on here. Um, as well, range and I think restaurant status here. So we've had some, and Elizabeth Alden um, up from the Wallapai tribal agent. So we've had lots of great, great attendance and interaction, and we look forward to seeing you in person next year. So thanks so much for attending, and we will see you down the road.